Hello, welcome to Transformation Tuesday Bible Study. We're going to uh, discuss more characteristics of God. We discussed eight last time. We're going to discuss eight more. Um, but before we even start, I want us to pray really quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that everybody here understands all of your characteristics so that they can get closer to you. Understand what you want. Understand who you are so that they can appreciate you more. And do the work that you want them to do for the kingdom of God, for your glory, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. We will be using the New King James Version of the Bible, but you can use any acceptable version or follow along with us on the screen because all the scripture will be available to you. Let's begin. So everyone, open up your Bibles to Psalms 25, 8, and also bookmark Psalms 106, 1, as well as Mark 10, 18. Psalms 25, verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. Psalms 106, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Mark chapter 10, verse 18. So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. So everyone, open up your Bibles to Psalms 104, verses 10 through 20. That's Psalms 104, verses 10 through 20. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them, the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the birds made their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. You make darkness and it is night in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. So let's continue on in Psalms 104, verses 21 through 28. That's Psalms 104, verses 21 through 28. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which all are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. There the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them they gather in. You open your hands they are filled with good. So God is good. Even when bad things happen to you, God is good. He created everything as an extension of his own nature. He provides for all of us, good and bad, meaning the people who disobey him, the people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, okay? And then of course, the people who do obey him. And he even favors them if you're really obedient and you really submit to him. So he's good, he's a provider. He provides us water, the food that we eat, everything that we have is because of him our shelter our jobs our food okay our clothes everything that we, our cars everything that we have is because of him because he loves us he even loves the ones who are bad but they're just not his children yet because they don't believe in Jesus Christ that's what I mean by bad so the more righteous you are the more you become more like God and you can be closer to him 
He's giving, so we should be giving. He's good, so we should be as good as he is. And he's good whether, you know, anything even bad happens to us. Because he uses that even for our good and also for his glory. So that's really what we're supposed to get out of this text. So everybody open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4 verses 8 through 10. And also bookmark John chapter 3 verse 16 as well as Romans chapter 5 verse 8. 1 John chapter 4 verses 8 through 10. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God is a loving God, okay? He is selfless in that he comes to embrace a world full of sinners, okay? He embraces all of us. And he gives us that grace, that chance to have that relationship with him through Jesus Christ. He loved us so much that he sacrificed his only begotten son for us so that we can have a way to have a relationship with him and not have to do all the works that the Hebrews or the Israelites had to do in order to have a relationship with him. That is the ultimate loving act Okay, that's the ultimate loving act of God. So if we don't love like he loves, then we don't know God. So we have to also be loving too. Not saying that we can't rebuke, but remember when we're rebuking, we're rebuking in order to get that person back in line with God and to build their righteousness. So that is also a form of love. So it's important to know that God is loving because as we're trying to build our relationship with God and be more like Christ, We want to grow in that area as much as we can. I know it's hard for some people, but that's also a way of getting closer to him. And being able to impart that love on others is also a way of bringing people into the body of Christ as well. Okay? So this is a very important characteristic of God. So everybody, open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. That's Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Also bookmark Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 30 through 32 as well as 2nd Chronicles chapter 30 verse 9 Exodus chapter 34 verse 6 and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord Lord God merciful and gracious long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 30 through 32 when you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether any great thing like this has happened or anything like it has been heard. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9. For when you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will receive mercy in the presence of their captors and return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. He will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. So let's continue on. Psalms 103, verse 8. And also bookmark Psalms 145 verses 7 through 9 as well as Joel chapter 2 verse 13. Psalms 103 verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Psalms 145 verses 7 through 9. 
They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Joel chapter two, verse 13. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. So God is merciful. He's also gracious, right? He is saving us from punishment of sins by being merciful to us. He could have been done with us because we're sinful beings and we're not born righteous necessarily, okay? So he could have done that, but he didn't. And he gives us the unmerited favor through grace. He forgives us for our sins once we repent and believe and have faith through Jesus, in Jesus Christ, in him through Jesus Christ. So he gives us that opportunity to have a relationship with him and he forgives us of our sins. And he continues to do that even when we continue to backslide or we sin in general. This is why we repent of our sins every single day, unknown and unknown, because he is faithful to forgive us of those sins. He's also merciful and graceful to do that. And also we have to be, we have to have those characteristics as well. That is part of the Holy Spirit as well, to be graceful and to be merciful in order to bring people into the body of Christ. And even when we're talking to brothers and sisters in Christ, to be merciful and graceful as well. Because with those qualities, we can also edify the body of Christ, which is often needed because we all know that the Christian walk is not easy. It's not easy, it's filled with trials, tribulations, issues. You know, people just being mean to you because you're Christian or they don't even wanna hear the gospel. So us being merciful and graceful to each other also builds us up. So if this is an area that you need to work on, just ask God and he'll help you in that area. And again, the more merciful and gracious we are, the better our relationship with him and the better our relationship with each other and even bringing people who are in the world to the body of Christ. So everybody open up your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 13 verses 22 to 23. That's 2 Kings chapter 13 verses 22 to 23. Also oh, um, bookmark Psalms 86 verses 14 through 15 and Psalms 11 verses 3 through 5. 2 Kings chapter 13 verses 22 to 23. And Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz. But the Lord was gracious to them, had compassion on them, and regarded them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not yet destroy them or cast them from his presence. Psalms 86 verses 14 through 15. O oh God, the proud have risen against me, and a mob of violent men have sought my life, and have not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Psalms 11 verses three through five. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. So God is a compassionate God. Compassion is when you show sorrow for another person's suffering and you earnestly, you honestly want to help, okay? So that's what compassion is. And God showed this when he didn't destroy Israel because of his covenant with Abraham and also in his protection of David from his enemies. David loved God. You know, he really, really didn't. He worshiped God and he always protected him. You, you can see this all throughout Psalms because David did commit a horrible sin, but yet and still because of the love and the worship and, and the trust in God that David had, the Lord showed him compassion, a lot of it, and would always protect him because he really felt for David's suffering and he saw how much David loved him. He also showed compassion for humanity by having that plan of redemption for us 
forgiving us for our sins so that we can be saved through Jesus Christ. And Jesus died for our sins. That is God showing compassion for humanity, knowing that we're sinful beings and God hates sin. But he gave us a solution. And Jesus also showed compassion by helping, uh, giving the gospel, by performing miracles, by doing healings. This is all compassion because, of course, if you're healing somebody, that person is suffering from something, an illness, whatever it is. And also doing deliverance, delivering people from demons. This is what Jesus was doing. And we have to be, that means that we have to be compassionate as well. Because as we're going through this Christian walk, as we're going on this journey, we have to grow in Christ likeness, basically. We have to grow in holiness and we have to be more like God and be more like Jesus Christ. And these are obviously, this is obviously a characteristic that they both possessed. And so we have to possess that too. This helps us better serve the body of Christ. This helps us bring other people into the body of Christ as well. And brings us closer to God, of course. And makes us love him even more that even though we're sinful, even though we're human, and we still have that free will and we could always fall into it, we could always come back to him. We could always come back to him. We could always repent and come back to him. Repent means that you turn away from that sin. You don't do it again. But he has this resolution. He has this resolution for us to have this re relationship with him. And we need to take that seriously because he didn't have to do it. And because he shows that compassion and we have the Holy Spirit in us as believers, we must show that compassion to others in every single walk of life. That is at work. That is just in general with the world because we're trying to bring them into the body of Christ. You know, sometimes bringing somebody into the body of Christ is not just giving them the gospel. It's actually showing you showing that you're living the gospel and you showing the compassion that God has for us. Yes, he has his wrath, but that's when we do something wrong and he wants us to bring, he wants to bring us, bring us back to him. That's the whole point, you know, he, and he'll show that compassion. He'll show that favor. So we have to do the same as well. So everybody, let's open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 6, and bookmark Numbers chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 6. Now the Lord ascended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Numbers chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Part of the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So now everybody open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 2 verses 2 through 4. That's Romans chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, and also bookmark 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Romans chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. But we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me, first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, 
to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So God is also patient and slow to anger. We see this with Adam and Eve. He could have destroyed humanity right then and there because they sinned. But what did he do? He continued with his plan for restoration of our relationship with him through Jesus Christ. He continued it anyway. That shows that he is slow to anger and he's patient. He also showed this during Noah's time when humanity was out of control during that time as well and Noah was building the ark. So he showed that then he's showing it now that he's patient because he's given everybody, he's giving everybody grace to come to him. Everybody. Everybody who has not come to him yet, he's, you still have a chance. People still have a chance until they die. This is why the gospel is so important and it's so important that we get it out there because you never know when you're going to leave this earth. Nobody knows. And if you leave this earth without the gospel and you had ample opportunity, you it was offered to you many times, you've heard it in churches, you've heard it from somebody, a friend or whoever, and you didn't take it, you're going to hell. But he's giving us ample opportunity while we're alive to believe in Jesus Christ and restore relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He's also patient with us during our sanctification process once we're believers. We make mistakes, we backslide, we can always recover. We can always repent and come back to him. You know, he may he punishes us, of course, when we do. But that's, again, like I said before, to bring us back to him. So, and that's his patience. He is really a father to us, except that when it comes to his punishment, we don't know what that's going to be. We don't know when it's coming. That's why it's important to repent of all sins, known and unknown, every day. He gives us that chance to. It doesn't take but maximum 30 seconds to do. You might as well just do it so that you keep in good standing with the Lord and he continues to, to strengthen you and to help you in your walk with him and to help you in life in general. So we should appreciate that with him and we also, again, have to emulate that with him. We have to be, remember in the Bible it says, be angry but sin not. And we have to be patient even with people when they're talking to us and not be so quick to anger all the time because God isn't so quick to anger all the time. Yes, he does punish when he needs to, but he's patient with us during our walk. And he also does expect certain things from us in our walk. Like if we've been in our walk longer, he expects us to already know certain things and not do certain things. So maybe the punishment will be slightly harsh than maybe if we were starting out because we should already know. So we should really appreciate this quality of his and ask him to give us this same quality. Remember, during our walk and our sanctification process, we're trying to grow to be more like Jesus Christ, who was also the son of God, the only begotten son of God, and who was God in the flesh. So that means that we have to be more like Jesus Christ and God. It basically is the same thing. So this is definitely a quality that we want to have as well, and we should be grateful to God for it. So open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 2 through 4, and also bookmark Psalms chapter 31 verses 4 through 6. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 2 to 4. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as rain drops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Psalms 31 verses 4 through 6. Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. I have hated those who regard useless idols, but I trust in the Lord. So let's continue on Isaiah chapter 65, verses 14 through 16. That's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 14 through 16. Also bookmark John chapter 3, verses 32 through 35. Isaiah chapter 65 verses 14 through 16. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart. 
but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and wail for grief of spirit. You shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen, for the Lord God will slay you and call his servants by another name, so that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hidden from my eyes. John chapter 3 verses 32 through 35. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So God is honest and truthful. As we all know but from our last presentation, he is also sinless. He is honest. No, there's no lies in him. Satan is the father of all lies, but God is truthful. Jesus is the truth and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So we have to grow in our honesty as well. Again, the more truthful we are, the more closer we get to God. This is also why we need to um, make sure that we understand these characteristics because it builds up our relationship with him. We have to become more godly, you know, and that also protects us from the lies of the enemy, okay? So since he's trustworthy, that also means that his word is the truth. Every single word inside the Bible is true. Don't even doubt it. You cannot doubt it as a believer. Every single thing in there is true and that is to be our first source of anything, to question things about the world, to help us get through our days, to help us resolve issues, to help us solve problems, to help us with relationship issues, whatever issues we have, we go to the word of God first. Why? Because it's the truth and it comes from him. Okay? So we. this is another reason why God hates lies. He hates deceitfulness. He doesn't like any of that because he is a man of truth. Jesus is the truth. So he's not going to like lies, which is why we have to make sure not to do that as believers. And if we do, it's great that we have that solution of repentance, but we want to lie less and less as we grow in our sanctification process. And the more honest we are, the more we can bring people into the body of Christ. When we're giving the gospel, we rely on the Holy Spirit for us to preach that gospel or give that gospel to any non-believer. And it'll be truthful. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. That is where we go to for everything, even at work. Don't lie at work. If you're working, really work. <laughs> Don't be on um, the internet all day because he sees that too and he's the one who got you that job. He, he loves honesty. God loves honesty and he loves truth. And so it behooves us to do that same thing in every area of our lives and rely on his word for guidance and truth because it's not going to lead us far from anything, from being successful in life, from being closer to him, okay, from, from blessings. It only helps us, you know, and you can be truthful and honest, but also be compassionate at the same time, even with hard topics. When you rely on him and you rely on his strength and you rely on the Holy Spirit within you to do so because it's the spirit of truth. That's how this supernatural um, transfer works. So it's important that we embrace this characteristic of his. And since he is a God of truth, then that means that we can trust him with everything. Like I said in my last video, we can trust him with everything because he never lies to us. God is not a man that he should lie. He never lies to us. So we have to make sure to rely on him for everything. He is trustworthy. He's honest. Good or bad, he'll tell us what we need to fix. Sometimes reading that Bible reveals us and what we need to change within us. What we need to pray for him to step in and help us change. Help remove certain desires. Help us become more righteous. Help us become more like Jesus Christ. Make our minds captive to Christ, to Christ because Christ is the truth. He is the word as well. So you see how this all works? So yes, God is trustworthy. He is honest and truthful. 
And that's also another reason why we can believe in everything that he says and what he sets out for us to do through his guidance in the word of God and people in the body of Christ like teachers and prophets and prophetesses and pastors who were really ordained by him to do those things in the spirit of truth with the Holy Spirit within them. So let's go on to the next characteristic. So everybody, open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 6. That's Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 6. And bookmark Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. That's Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 6. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 8 through 10. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, Know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. So let's continue on Isaiah chapter 49, verses 5 through 7. Also bookmark Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 5 through 7. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him, for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 to 24. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. So everybody, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 24. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 24. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So God is faithful. He's somebody that we can trust, like I said before, and he is faithful to perform everything he said he would do um, in the future. Everything that he said in the Bible that has happened has really happened. His prophecies have been fulfilled or are going to be fulfilled. And so we should have faith in him. We should also have faith when he says that he doesn't like sin and he's, he will punish us. Yes. So we have faith in what he says, good and bad, that he, it, all his promises and all his punishments, that he will do it. Okay. And that also means that we should believe in him too. Even when we pray, we should have that faith that he'll do it, especially if it's within his will. That's why it's very important for us to understand the word of God. Okay. And also he is faithful to punish the people who have not come to Christ. 
he's faithful to that. Yeah, he's faithful to sending them, unfortunately, to hell if they have it. So good and bad, he's faithful. And everything that he does for us is for our good, good and bad. Things that happen in the world, like for instance, this last sickness, I'll call it. That was also for our good. There's a lot of good that came out from that, even though it was such a horrible time. And the good varies for different people from different countries, you know, in different ways. All right. And we talked about that in my um, restoration video. But yes, so he does everything for our good. Anything that's within his will, he's faithful to perform it. And that's why we need to go to him with everything. You know, he doesn't want us to live in sin, right? Or he wants us to be repentant. So why not go to him to help remove those desires or help decrease those desires so that we don't sin or don't do that sin anymore because we should be sinning less as we grow in our sanctification process, okay? And why not go to him if we want to have a job or we want, because he, th this is within his will. He wants us to do well. He wants us to prosper, not just because he wants us to be super rich or anything. That's not what I'm talking about. He wants us to prosper because if we prosper, then the kingdom can prosper. If we prosper, then the kingdom can prosper. That's the whole point for his glory. That's a wonderful thing for his glory. If we prosper and we were able to bring that testimony to somebody, that can bring that person into the body of Christ just off of our testimony, plus also giving them the gospel. That's why he does all these things. So even when we're going through suffering, a hard time of suffering, that's also for his glory at the end of the day. And he's faithful to bring us to an expected end. He's faithful to restore us. Okay, everything that he said in, the, in his word, he's faithful to. And reading his word every day, there can be different meanings in each passage, depending on who you are, depending on what you're going through. But that's also why we can rely on him and also why we need to have faith in him. We need to have unshakable, unbreakable faith in the Lord because he's faithful. And that, again, brings us closer to him. This, is, this whole teaching is so that you can get closer to him and understand what he wants in us. He wants us to be a lot like him, obviously, for his glory. So because he's faithful, we have to be faithful. We have to believe that everything that he said in his word is true. His punishments, his rewards, his blessings, his promises, every single thing that he says is true and he's faithful to perform it at any given time. So we should have faith in him through Jesus Christ as well. So everybody, open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 5. That's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 5, as well as bookmark uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. That's 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 5. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain. My speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children, because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So God is just and righteous. He keeps the moral order of the world and he is right in the way he treats all of humanity. Everything he does is right. So even if you're suffering, you can't blame God. You can't say, God, why are you doing this to me? You don't say that. Mm -mm. Because even if you've been righteous, maybe he's trying to build you up. Maybe he's trying to sharpen you as well. And it could also be the enemy for whatever reason. But that also brings you closer to him so that he can get the enemy off of you. Okay, and because he's righteous, 
That means that he hates sin. And in order for us to grow in righteousness, we have to live repentant lifestyles. We have to be sinning less and less in our walk, okay? And the reason why he punishes us, and, and that's just, that's correct, is for us to correct that behavior so that we can have that relationship with him. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ yet, you need to believe in Jesus Christ so that you can become more righteous, okay? You need to believe in him because we're all sinners and God hates sin. He hates sin. So already as a sinner, you're far away from him. But once you believe in Jesus Christ, you now have the relationship with him and you get even closer to the Lord when you're living a righteous, repentant lifestyle according to his word. So you know what all those sins are. As a, as a believer, most of you know what those are. You know the Ten Commandments. You know what God hates. <laughs> so you know what to avoid. And you also know what to lean into him for help to avoid. Because his will is for you to grow in righteousness as a believer. There is nothing wrong in leaning into him. I don't like when people tell you that, oh, you can't ask God for that. That's just something you have to work on. No, then you're relying on self. You become more righteous by the power of the Holy Spirit within you and obeying God's word. When you don't obey the Lord, you're sinning. So you have to become obedient and you have to live repentant lifestyles in order to be closer to God and in order to reap blessings from him and have favor for him and even for him to show you what your spiritual gift is so that you can help build the kingdom of God. He's not going to, <laughs> he's not going to give you that second baptism of the Holy Spirit if you don't surrender and you're not obedient. He needs people to be obedient. He needs to ordain people. He needs to see that in you in order for you to get that. I, I definitely had it. It was quite an experience. So it does exist. Don't believe people when they say it doesn't exist. But that's also it. That second outpouring is because he's seen how obedient that you've, that you've been. He's seen that you've submitted and committed to him. And so he gave you that second baptism, which we're going to talk about at some point. But that also helps you. And that's why you have to be more righteous. You have to be sinning less. If you know that, you know, going to events will cause you to drink a lot, don't go to those type of events. You know, sometimes you need to be alone with God so that he can reform you, so that he can change you, so that he can bring you closer to him. You know, this is why when you're a new believer, it's best not to be on be posting videos or to be doing certain things a lot because he's still molding you. You need to be with him and be in the word and understand what his requirements are. Because the closer you get to him, the better because he's going to guide you better. The, the more unholy that you are, the more sinful that you are, the more he moves away from you. The more he moves away from you. That's why it's a daily thing. You reading the Bible is not just so that you also obey. It also strengthens the Holy Spirit within you. And then that also strengthens the conviction so that you know, okay, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to watch porn. I'm not going to commit fornication because I know that that's going to ruin my relationship with God. That's going to make me backslide and it's going to be a lot for me to get that relationship back with God. Yes, he'll take you back. Absolutely. You can come back from a backslide, but you don't want to backslide. That's the whole point. So sinning is disobedience against God. You want to rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you towards that righteousness and read the word of God to, to understand how God's behavior is. Look at these scriptures in this teaching and my past teaching. Meditate over them. Read them so that you really understand his behavior and what he likes and what he doesn't like. And read the word more and more. And you'll see that the Holy Spirit in you will be stronger. And you will have a stronger relationship with God. And then he can show you what your purpose is in life. Whether that's an actual job, okay? Or that's even um, any of the spiritual gifts. Anything in the five-fold ministry. Five-fold ministry, that's prophets, apostles. When I mean apostles, by the way, I mean like church planters. That's what it means modern day. Lowercase a, not capital, okay? pastors, teachers, and evangelists. So he's preparing you for that because you need to be sinning less because those things are not easy to do. Once he ordains you to do those things, trust me, it's not easy. 
and you have the enemy coming at you in every single way for you to, to trip you up, to get back into that sin, to fall away, to fall further away from God because your soul is precious. The enemy wants it. God wants it. You want it to be with God. You want your soul to be with God and not the enemy. So I really hope that this teaching blessed you. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and have a blessed week. Thank you.